So that was very powerful, and I think uh, certainly from an educational standpoint, observational standpoint, uh, the CCS cards were highly instrumental in, uh, in the cause and effect of that. The contribution from every individual was the same and articulated uh, in a highly useful way. The CCS cards in a, in a kit or a pack, along with some of the little CCS stickers and a wall chart that kind of had a day-to-day -day thing, so they would choose a card at the end of every day for the most significant thing they learned. Thank you for joining us. This is Craig Brown, developer of the CCS, and welcome to our CCS Expert Series. It's a series of valuable interviews where we invite experts who use the CCS in their communication work to share their insights, ideas and stories to help you tap the full potential of the CCS in your own communication endeavours. In this episode, we talk with Dr Stephanie Burns, a leading expert on adult learning, influential communication and the emotional experience of learning and goal achievement. She's conducted thousands of events, has trained in many different environments all over the world, from classrooms to convention centres, churches to university halls, boardrooms to living rooms, and she's travelled the world immersing herself in all manner of learning situations, from computers to Latin dancing to horsemanship. She's taught groups of 50 people to play the guitar, taught old people to juggle and young people to think, and she's also a CCS user. We're speaking with Stephanie in her home in Sydney. Hello, Stephanie. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and very excited to be speaking with you. Thank you very much for agreeing to be part of our interview series. I'm happy to do that. We have a long association. Stephanie, I was really keen to have you on our program. You have a fabulous reputation in Australia and around the world as a thought leader on adult education, learning and influential communication in thank those you. areas. And we'll delve into all of that shortly. But to kick off, I think it's important for us all to hear a bit about your story. So you, if you could tell us a little about where you've come from, how you ended up in Australia, and the kinds of learning areas you've taken yourself into. Sure. Well, that's a, like I said, it's a challenging question because it's been an awfully long career. But, uh, in, you know, I suppose in the shortest nutshell that I can do, I mean, I, I've been in Australia, I guess, now for 25 years. Obviously, I come from the States, which people can tell from my accent. Um, I started out um, as a student in the United States Army studying engineering and uh, ended up teaching engineering in, in the service. Uh, I just, I, For me, personally, I just loved all the technical subjects, and really computers were just kind of coming online in those days, and I was keen to be involved. So uh, I did that. I went on to be an engineer working for several companies through my early 20s. But along with um, that engineering work, I also taught uh, computer technology, be it computer literacy or a lot of the new programs coming on within the corporate sector. And one of the things I found fascinated me more than the technology that I was teaching was the reaction of the adult student sitting in the classroom. So, of course, these were highly successful adults already with their career, already extremely well-educated. And I found when you put them in, back in a classroom with uh, a desk and a pen and a paper and an authority figure, uh, you know, their range of behavior became extremely limited. They they were quite shy in the classroom. They, uh, it was difficult for them to participate. They didn't like making mistakes. And so basically the kind of student they'd been as young children is what I found them uh, still um, acting as, as 30, 40, and 50-year-old adults. And this whole... Um, kind of range of behavior or change in behavior in the classroom was quite fascinating for me. And so in my late 20s, I started to focus my studies and my interest more on the dynamics of, the, of that human behavior in that context. And that area has really driven the rest of my career. So uh, for many years, I looked at uh, um, how to make adults uh, be more effective as learners. So um, of course, they use the the skills and learning strategies they had when they were young children in school, which were wonderful for a third grader and fourth grader, but wholly inadequate for an adult entering a professional classroom situation. Uh, so one of the big things I did was I did a program called Learning to Learn, which basically helped adults reevaluate their experience of school and to give them a whole new set of strategies to apply when they entered a classroom environment. And that work uh, I brought here to Australia on the back end of a program called the Discovery Camps, which is a model after the Super Camp program in America working with teenagers in a very similar area. So it was 
teenagers' brains and nervous systems are maturing, uh, they needed a different set of strategies to excel in the school environment. And so that led on into the adult work, which, again, I brought here to Australia, and the uptake here and uh, my love for the Australian culture, you know, those two things combined kept me here. Of course, part of that, you know, you're training adults to be better learners, but the other side of that coin is how do you then teach um, trainers and instructors, managers, leaders to be more effective in facilitating uh, change processes in adults. And so for, uh, again, many years uh, side by side with that and sometimes exclusively I worked much more in the side of uh, working with trainers, working with leaders, working with individuals who had it in their interest to be able to influence change in other people, be it one-to-one or one-to-many. Uh, and, you know, so for, I would say for a good 15 years, most of my life was dominated by being uh, in front of groups, doing a lot of lecturing, a lot of traveling. And I would say, you know, for the most part in the last 10 or 12 years, it's been back to study for me, looking at more difficult problems to deal with human behavior and communication. And so I still do some lecturing, mostly in the areas of diversity, leadership communication, influential communication, etc. Um, and then I have my own personal interests. I seem to be, you know, guinea pig X. So as soon as we kind of discover, have an idea about a more effective way of doing something, you know, the first cab off the rank to test those methods is usually myself engaged in some sort of learning activity. And if they hold sway, if they're if they're um, effective, then of course the next step is to teach those things to other people. So, you know, it's kind of been a, that kind of cycle really for my whole career, and I would say I'm very much still in that kind of cycle. So that's, that's a little bit about me. So obviously that work has brought me into government and and uh, the military and corporate sector, the education sector, um, in lots of different communities. Wherever there are human beings who are required to grow or change um, in order to do their jobs effectively will tend to be someplace I've traveled at some point in time. Fabulous. And we um, in Australia are very pleased to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm particularly interested in your use, Stephanie, of the term influential communication. Mm. What do you see as a, as a key difference between just communicating and being an influential communicator? Well, I think, you know, when we look at our day-to-day -day communications, we would, we, you know, essentially we could say that no communication we have with another human being does not have an effect. So there's a cause effect that goes on with communications. Even if you come home uh, in the afternoon and you find your spouse to be a bit down in the dumps and a bit blue, typically what you'll find is your next line of communication is somehow trying to influence how they're feeling in the moment, either trying to make them feel better, to understand what's going on, or to move them in some particular way. And so all of our communication on a day-to-day -day basis has some sort of effect on the person we're speaking with. In turn, of course, they're affecting us. But when I talk about influential communication in a professional sense, I'm talking about communications that are targeted for that, meaning I know in advance that I'm going into uh, a context or into an environment whereby my intent is to cause a particular change, either in how somebody feels and how they do something uh, or in how they think about something. So on a professional level, normally we're thinking in advance about the kind of outcomes our communications have, and we are um, designing our communications to have that kind of specific impact um, uh, in a much more direct line sense. So it's not kind of willy-nilly hoping. Now, most people, of course, tend to communicate in a professional sense of the same way they do around the dinner table, meaning without necessarily a lot of awareness of the impact that they're having. And a lot of my work is trying to shape the idea that all communication has a power of influence and it's best to be prepared knowing in advance what kind of outcomes you're looking for and going directly to achieve those with communication. Excellent. Yeah, that's very clear. Now, your correct title is Dr. Stephanie Burns. You did a doctorate uh, in the area of emotional experience of adult learners and goal achievement. Mm. Mm, I did. Can you tell us a little about what you found out in that study? That was an interesting study. I mean, it really came on the back end of finding a problem in my own teaching. I always had this hallucination that if you taught people to be effective, more effective learners and had given them, you know, ample amounts of evidence 
that if they applied those strategies, they could essentially do whatever it is they wanted to do, be it achieve a, a master's degree or swim 500 meters or, you know, whatever it was. So my hallucination was that if you gave people kind of this self-efficacy um, uh, with evidence, that they would wake up then the next day and go do something with it. You know, they would actually, yeah, they would like go, oh, I can, I know for a fact I can do this. It's something I desire, therefore I'm going to go do it. Um, but, of course, I didn't find that at all. What I found is most people, um, you know, have a lot of goals. Like setting goals is not difficult. People people have things they want to do. Uh, and even armed with all of the evidence that they have an effective strategy to do that well, you know, they still wake up in the morning and do nothing for the most part. It's just fascinating. And I, I realized that none of my work really dealt with issues of motivation, what causes people... Um, in the moment, like right now, to either get off the couch and go take an action toward a goal or stay sitting on the couch and watching TV. It's like there's there's this thing that happens that is required for goals to be achieved, and that's frequent and consistent action in the direction of the goal. We have to be able to do a little bit over a long period of time. Um, and what I found was that people had very few strategies for managing their motivation behavior kind of in the moment, in a, in a moment-to-moment basis. So the study wanted to really to take a look at what the cause of that was. And what we knew is that um, uh, large numbers of adults who, again, have succeeded in achieving many things, nonetheless, when it comes to personal and professional goals they set, um, by and large, fail to achieve those goals. And so I was quite curious about this. And, and the study was to illuminate what the problem was. And what we found the problem to be was that, uh, again, we're, we are biological entities, and and learning is problematic. So learning is challenging. It's difficult. We feel uncomfortable. It's awkward. We get cold. Our hands get tired. Our, we get confused mentally. It's it's frustrating. It has a lot of anxiety. It's, you know, the learning, learning isn't fun, basically. Learning is, you know, doing something's fun. Getting to be able to do it is quite difficult. Uh, and we know that you know we're wired up such that if what we're doing isn't fun or what we imagine we're going to be doing is not fun, meaning it's not a pleasant experience, that we will use you know the mighty brain power we have to find a good enough reason to not do it. So we'll come up with excuses and rationale about doing it tomorrow or the next week will be a better time or maybe when the kids are grown and out of school, that'll be a better time. And so if we can create an, an excuse or rationale that feels just right, if you will, feels like, oh, you know, it feels like I'm relieved, then I have given myself uh, a guilt-free way to not do what I said I was going to go about doing. So it's a really interesting thing to recognize that, you know, underneath our our, our desires and, and, and uh, you know, what some people might say willpower uh, to achieve something is undermined by kind of a little emotional response that says, uh, do I feel like going to the pool this morning? And if I imagine going to the pool being problematic and there's parking and there's cars and there's cold and someone's going to kick me in the head and I start imagining all the unpleasant nature of it, the answer to the question, do I feel like it's going to be no? And if I can come up with a good enough excuse to not feel guilty about it, then I'm I'm going to just hunker in under the covers and stay in bed. So that was I feel like I've been found out. Yes, well yes. Well that's what all that's what all of my students say. <laughs> that's right. That's what all like, listen, I do the same thing. I'm driven by the same biological imperatives. Uh the next game was could we we did have people who seemed to override those feelings and I was quite curious how then did some people persist. It seemed extraordinary that anybody ever got anything done. And uh, we tracked those people. We we were able to gather the kind of internal um, uh, thought processes and internal dialogue they had when faced with the same kinds of questions. And we found that those people had direct um, kind of cognitive resources that were learned. So they had learned, for example, lines like, boredom is not a good enough reason to stop. Or um, don't think about it. Meaning, if they're going to go do something, they don't, they don't ask themselves, do I feel like going to the pool? They just get in the car and go. Uh, or they think about how good it feels when they're done. Or they think about how 
bad meaning worse they're going to feel if they have to come home and tell their partner they didn't go. So they manage their emotional tone. They still feel bad. They still have the same emotional response to learning, but they moderate that by either thinking about something that's going to make them feel worse by not doing it or better if it does get done. And we found these strategies were very consistent. We found they were learned behavior, so they've been trained to think like this. And that was the key for me to say, well, if they're learned behaviors, then can we teach these to other people? And the goal achievement program came out of that research. So it came as a mechanism for teaching other people to utilize those strategies. And on from that, the online, some of the online courses dealt with it. Uh, some of the books dealt with it, um, all the Ph.D. work in detail, including the strategies. Um, I've been interviewed on that extensively. All that's over at the Facebook page. People can still access all that work if they're interested. So so that's what it was really about. It was there to solve a problem, and then, surprise, surprise, we found some unique things that we could offer back to the community. People have gone on to do amazing things as a result of knowing how to manage that behavior. Well, not amazing things. I mean amazing by the fact that they're the things that they say they want to do. Hmm. And they weren't doing them before. Uh, they weren't getting them done, no. no. Now, it was about that time, around the time of your goal achievement work, that you and I first met. Mm. You know, we were introduced by a mutual friend who was a student of yours. And I think, uh, in your words, it was described as, set me up with some guy called Craig who wants to show me a communication tool. Yes, that's probably about exactly how I would have said that. Do you recall that meeting? Yes. <laughs> I do recall it very well. Yes, I remember we came together and we had a terrific meeting and I showed you the CCS cards. Mm. But what I thought I would like to ask you to share for everyone is really what happened after that meeting. I guess what was really your first personal experience with the CCS? Yeah, I mean, I think after that meeting... Um, what I certainly what I found in the meeting was that this was a uh, kind of a, a mechanism, if you will, to create a communicate cause communication to be um, much more direct and much more focused. I mean, it, I, I know, knew from you know tens of years of experience working with people that if you ask them questions, the quality level, depth, logic level, if you will, of their response is highly variant from vague and diffuse to overly specific to whatever the case may be. It, it, you know, no two people will hit um, a question at the same logic level. Um, there is a logic level that's useful, and there are many that aren't very useful. So the way people ask themselves questions or ask and then answer questions oftentimes don't net quality, a quality of information that you can work with. And so what I had seen with the CCS cards was that they created or gave, um, if you will, a communication context that, that um, if you will, drilled in to, very finely to ensuring that the response or answer to a question or to a pondering or a reflection um, was always at a logic level that was highly useful. And so after leaving the meeting, I started to play with the CCS cards myself. I think you had given me a, a set of cards, and I took them home, and they sat on my desk. And I started to kind of experiment just with the kinds of questions uh, or ruminations that I would be having on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for example, I might be looking at, say, a decision coming up around a project. and I'm So I would use the CCS cards by framing a question around the decision I needed to make. And I might say, you know, Stephanie, go ahead and select five cards that tell you in what way will doing this project or making this decision have effects on the other things you're doing. Let's say a question like that. Uh, and I would shuffle through the cards and invariably, you know, as you know, the cards or the images on the cards suggest certain kind of ideas. So it's not that it created the ideas. It gave me a way of capturing an idea. So, of course, at the end of that little session, I'd have five things quite clear and quite articulate that I could say about how this was going to affect that. Now, I know if I just sat there in my day pondering that question, uh, one, I might have gotten two of those and not the other three. Um, I might have gotten ten and, not, and that would have been too many to work with. They would have all been at different logic levels. 
Uh, and I would have ended up with something that maybe didn't put me any further along around understanding the effects of the decision, as did the CCS card. So what the CCS cards for me became was a vehicle, a vehicle for ensuring that what I was um, articulating was always in at a logic level that was useful for me. And on from that, then I started to experiment um, with other people, giving them to children, for example, to say, pick three cards to tell me how your day was at school today. And it's amazing. I got three things. They were all interesting and all useful. And as you know, having children, if you said to your kids when they're little, you know, tell me how your school day was, you know, good odds you're just going to get, eh, it's fine. You know, eh, it was okay. Good. Eh, good. It was good. Yeah. What did you do at school day? Nothing. <laughs> but if you say, tell, pick three cards to tell me some of the things you did at school today, you're going to get three things. And they're going to be interesting, and they're all going to be at the same level. Mm. And you can start to work with that then. I like that, all at the same level, yes. Yes, so it kind of, yes, it does that very, very precisely. Whether it was it in CCS cards, whether it was the in, its intention or not, it is, in my experience, what it does. And I've gone on to use that to great effect in lots and lots of different um, uh, teaching and leadership situations, etc. So I use them for myself, but I use them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I also go on and use them in, in classroom environments when appropriate. Yes, let's talk more about those kinds of situations when you've used the CCS, say, in learning to learn or in sure. trainer trainer. Well, same thing. I mean, normally what used to happen prior to that, I mean, I might uh, stand on stage and ask people to share with me um, what they just learned, say, out of an experience they just had. And I might get 10 out of 50 hands that go up and the quality of the information uh, is variant. So some people give me something that's, you know, long-winded and I just wish they would stop talking because they're not, you know, not really adding anything. Other people will be so short, I couldn't get enough meaning out of it. Uh, with the CCS cards, now 50 people have a set of CCS cards. Uh, they're all asked the question. They're all asked to choose the same number of cards. They go through and then they're all asked to turn to a neighbor and share that information. So now 50 people have three things each or five things each of good value for them and for others to hear. Uh, they all get a chance to share that. It's faster than me eliciting it from stage. And then I can look at the group and say... You know, tell me, raise a hand if you just heard something that was really out there and really different and something you didn't expect. Now I'll get the same ten hands, but what I'll get is something very precise, and they will be the most interesting things that just happened in the room. See, if I just call on people, I have no idea what they're going to say. They need to say it, but I don't know that the rest of the group needs to hear it. So what this did was it just it just was like a funnel where you just, you know, through an idea in, and what came out the bottom was something very, very pure, very fine, very, and, and something I could really work with quite directly. So if I use it in a classroom situation, it does that kind of thing. I'm curious. Do you think there's a link between the way CCS cards work and your understanding of the emotional experience of learning and communication? Uh, well, that's a good question. I've never thought about that. Um, well, I've stumped I think, you. Well, you have. Um because it was yeah, what's not um I, I have never been looking at the cards as a way to facilitate I mean, I certainly could imagine even now just using the cards to assist people when, for example, they may be shy or embarrassed or lack confidence in communicating or sharing an idea. I could imagine the cards would go quite a long way to helping people say something that they otherwise kind of stumble because the emotion sometimes are so big that it scrambles people's minds, if you will, and then they don't speak very clearly. Um, I do think the cards would probably short-circuit that. They, they'd still have the emotional response, but they would then still then be able to have a functioning brain to be able to communicate. Um, I find certainly I've used them or suggested that they be used by people who are designing pre uh, and preparing for presentations, for example. People who are really nervous talking in front of other people. Um, the cards do help them settle on what are the three things I absolutely want to get said. And because they have the image which becomes memorable for them, which then is tied to the content, you know, I can get them much more easily up uh, without using any notes and without kind of having that angst of, oh, my God, what am I going to, you know, what, what if I forget what I'm going to say? So, yes, I do think they can have an impact 
um, in emotional situations and getting people to be more clear and articulate. I can even imagine they could be used in a therapeutic sense, for example, or in a family counseling, for example. I can imagine where, or in couples therapy, where the emotions are really high and no one's communicating anything of value because nobody's, nobody's, cause you're not clear and they can't hear anything. I do think the cards kind of being an external device outside yourself could facilitate qualities in communication you don't get in other mechanisms for sure. So, yeah, I think you're asking a very good question. and It's not anything I directly went after doing, but I certainly can imagine that it did do that vicariously and could do that much more directly if I did use them that way. Yeah, good point. Hmm. Now, I know that um, you also um, have done a lot of work in in all kinds of innovative ways to help people to use online learning um, and in particular, which is your style, to complete it. Like we don't, you don't want to just put it up there and have them start. Um, you want to make sure, first of all, no. they start and that no. they take it to the end and yeah. push through the pain and things. And uh, you took the CCS into that field as well. Um, can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, that those are two separate things. I mean, you're you're absolutely right that the you know, the purpose for me in designing the online courses I did and then going on and and uh using that methodology to assist uh, uh clients design their online programs was because there was just such a high attrition rate in online programs. It was PowerPoint, you know, basically online which bores people live let alone when you're sitting there in a room on your own. Uh, it was a lot of information disguised as education. There was a lot of it being sold and none of it being completed, and it drove me crazy uh, because I'd had a lot of experience in the past of looking at the use of media-based formats um, with an educational intent, which meant it had to hold people's attention, it had to get them to participate, it had to be sequenced properly, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, well, I know a lot about this, and the world's up you know, the uptake of online stuff, especially with the advent of the Internet, was getting quite big. And I thought, you know, it would be nice to create a couple models and see if I can tackle this directly. So I took a lot of my content from my programs and designed online courses around that with the number one intent of uh, of compliance and completion, you know, getting them one, as you say, to start and then to persist. So there was a little bit of work to do every day over a longish period of time, four weeks or six weeks, uh, to get to the end. And so could I hold their attention with the media? The second big, obviously, um, outcome was that there was measure, measurable educational outcomes at the end of that, that at the end they knew, you know, they'd achieved a set of outcomes that had been stated at the beginning of the program. So that was kind of my purpose for doing the online stuff. But in the mix of doing the online work, uh, my group's, my program's, a lot of them and not all, were designed to have people go through the programs together as a team. So they might go to get they might go through a program for four to six weeks with the same, say, fifteen or twenty people. Uh because doing something with a team or with a group, whether you know those people or not, I mean sometimes it'd be diverse people from all over the world doing the same program at the same time, uh, is that the observational learning, meaning seeing what's being taught through the eyes of someone else had a high educational value. And when that was the case, then I needed those people to be communicating. So I also then needed to make sure everybody communicated at the same level. Uh, so I started to send everyone uh, the CCS cards in a, in a kit or a pack, along with some of the little CCS stickers and a wall chart that kind of had a day-to-day -day thing. So they would choose a card at the end of every day for the most significant thing they learned, blah, blah, blah. Um, but more, most importantly, because they reported in, if not every day, then every couple of days, um, at the end of every lesson, there'd be a series of uh, questions or tasks, and they were asked to report on that task using the CCS card. So they might say, uh, choose three CCS cards to um, describe how you saw this effect in your day-to-day -day life or in your work life today. So what I would get is 20 people all choosing three cards, having three things to say in very precise terms. Now, if I didn't do that, I would get some people going, um, if I said, just describe how you saw this, and then some people would say, um, yeah, I thought it was really cool. I'd get other people who'd write half a book that no one would want to read and everything in between. 
So again, the CCS cards became levelers. They they leveled out the communication. So the quality from every individual was the contribution from every individual was the same and articulated uh, in a highly useful way. And then it was very tight. So other students they could choose to read other people's comments or not. It didn't matter to me. But you found that people liked following other people's commentary because it was very articulate. Uh, and slowly, over a very short period of time, people started to really connect as if they really were in the same room knowing each other. They started looking forward to what Mary Jane from London had to say because she always had really interesting ideas. But they were, of course, being expressed because I was using the CCS cards. Yeah, so we're actually we're, we're able to have some quality communication that is happening with that person themselves, and then they're able to uh, offline, yep. and then they're able to use that as yep. a common way to feedback. Yep to the rest of the group. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that was very powerful, and I think uh, certainly from an educational standpoint, observational standpoint, educational standpoint, uh, the CCS cards were highly instrumental in uh, in the cause and effect of that in the online programs. Okay. One last thing. I remember some years ago we sent 144 CCS vision packs across to the U.S., across to your homeland to the Pirelli Natural Horsemanship Ranch. And I remember thinking at the time, okay, this is a bit strange, the CCS alongside horses. Yes. And then I found out, of course, that you were looking at Pirelli's techniques with horses and what this meant for adult learning. Yes. Can you tell us a little about the CCS and the Pirelli work? Mm-hmm. Yes, and well, as I recall, I mean, I did a lot of different kinds of work with Pirelli. In the early days, I worked with their instructors, putting them through various types of programs. Uh, I designed a, um, an online learning site for them, uh, which was kind of a little, uh, if you will, a, a cabin off in the, in the online virtual environment that people could visit and grab on to learning strategies, motivation strategies, et cetera, et cetera. And then over time, what that was all leading to was a redesign of their level one and level two home study packs. And so this was a long process. I, I think I would have been with them for about four years. And at one point in time, I needed to go to the U.S. to do uh, to fulfill some of the, the aspects of that job. And I had all of their instructors at a conference, I believe is how – I believe it went – there's one of two things. I either did it as, and, I'm, and you're going to kill me because I probably can't remember clearly. I, I, I had, I know that there were about 120 instructors, so that sounds like about the right number of why I would have CCS cards over there. Uh, and I did work with them uh, quite extensively in a program at one of the annual conferences. Now my hallucination is that's where I would have used the CCS okay, cards. So de- we're, we're definitely using them with the students, not with the horses. No, the, no, no, definitely not with the horses. <laughs> Although now that you say that, it would have been a very interesting process to throw like 10 cards on the ground and uh, ask the horse to just go kind of, you know, have a wander and tap out what, you know, he thought was most intriguing in the day or what he thought about his owner probably is the the more interesting question. So I either use them there or also with Pirelli, I was doing some of the online course with the Labyrinth course, which was the Goal Achievers program online. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. may be that I had groups, groups going through and it was just easier for me to send the CCS cards from the U.S. because I was there for nine months, see, and not coming back into Australia during that period. Um, So I wish I could be more clear, but Pirelli um, instructors and the students who did the uh, Labyrinth online course or any of the online courses would definitely have been exposed to the CCS cards for sure. All right. Look, Stephanie, I'm really grateful for how much time you've given us. It's been terrific. It's been invaluable to hear these insights. And I particularly love that gem of positioning the CCS as a leveler, you know, mm. a communication leveler mm. that allows people to contribute or uncover multiple ideas at the same level of logic. So thank you very much for that. But just before you go, I just wanted to ask you a personal learning question. Yeah. With all the areas you've taken yourself into, and there's quite a list, you know, languages, yep, yep, musical all instruments, of it. dancing, mm-hmm. motorbikes, horsemanship, sure. voice recognition software, running... And, and I'm sure there's many more. But what's been your favorite thing to learn? Do you have a favorite thing? Well, that's a great question, too. Um, it, well, I guess 
what would I say to that? It's, it, they've all been interesting at the time I've been doing them. Let's put it that way, or I wouldn't have been doing them. Uh, but many of the activities, you know, the horsemanship and uh, and other things, were actually projects chosen because they the activity suited whatever I was testing in work, whatever I was trying to demonstrate. So if I was trying to demonstrate uh, the acquisition or effectiveness of teaching the nervous system a new pattern, let's say, then doing something on the piano or the guitar or juggling, for example, those things became perfect activities to test it with uh, or to demonstrate that with. So a, a lot of the things I've done, and I know people's perception of me out there is that I must love doing all this stuff. I don't really. I mean, I, you know, in the main, I like reading. You know, I like watching television. I am not an overly active sort. But people can would obviously be led to think some other thoughts for sure. But in but all the things I did that really also had a very personal thing, meaning I had a passion for it. Um, certainly, the, the sprinting was one of those. Um, I just had this have this incredible urge sometimes to want to do things that are physically very demanding and very hard. Um, and 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 sprinting was one of those things that. Um, I loved. I loved the energy of it. I loved the trial and error of it. I, I just loved the whole saturation. How fast can you know this, these muscles and these, this, these bones move through space? I mean, what an interesting question to ask. Especially when you start, you go, I don't know. I, I have without good training, I have no clue how fast these bones can go over 100 meters. So I like things like that, and I love that. And of course, music's been a common thread coming in and out of my life since from the time I was a kid. Um, and I have brought it in as a as an element within projects all throughout my career. So whenever I needed an activity uh, for which music was suitable, then I that's what I did. So from teaching, learning to learn guitar, which had, you know, we did ran that for four years, 50, 50 people with guitars in a classroom at one time is really a sight to behold. It's fascinating. And it, what it really did was it allowed me to play for four years, which was fun. But now I'm at a point where music really is the dominant theme. So it's, you know, I've just, um, I think as I said to you earlier when we were chatting, I've just completed uh, my master's in guitar with the Berkeley College of Music, which is a really big deal. Was that in residence? No, I did it online um, from Australia. I didn't want to uh, move over to the U.S. to do that. And And online, their programs are brilliant because they... You really you're there with you know ten to twenty other really high quality musicians. You have access. The, the programs are written incredibly well. You have weekly um, interaction with your students. You're recording every week, getting feedback every week uh, directly from the Berkeley professors. You're working with the best professors at Berkeley or many of the best professors at Berkeley. And I think to be honest with you, I had more access to them online than I would have if I'd been a live student in a way. I would have been a member of a class raising my hand, maybe getting attention. Here, I had tremendous amount of attention, uh, and that went on for, you know, I had 12 semesters of school to do. I've also been playing drums alongside of that. Um, and I and so, uh, you know, music for me is the thing I always wanted to do, and I'm just fortunate enough to be at a stage in my career where I can make that be kind of something I don't have to give up anymore. So I don't have to choose to stop doing that because of a job or because I'm traveling. Um, I have a lot more choices now. And So, yeah, I think the sprinting was a really big thing for me. I had a personal passion for it, and the music is a personal passion. All the other things I loved doing at the time. But, you know, see, I never woke up in the morning and said, I know what I want to do. I want to go ride a horse today. Like, it just, you know, I get people do that. They love them. And I loved being part of it. I loved having horses. I loved the whole thing. But it's not my passion. You know, it's not the thing I was driven to do. I was doing it because it helped me serve other people who were doing it. And I would say most of the activities have been more in that vein than, you know, uh, than the others. So, yeah, so that's, you know, so the music really is the big thread. And I still have quite a big physical outlet. I'm not sprinting at the moment, but, you know, I'm either in the gym or doing something else that's quite physical. Uh, the drums are very physical, which I love about them, and mm-hmm. it's all good. I actually I actually had a, a music teacher. Because um, you play guitar, teacher. don't you? I play some guitar. That's but, um, right, and you but, sing. Uh, well, a little, but I had a singing teacher who told me about um, using the CCS with her singing students as a 
as a way of, I know that you had used the CCS, and we're not going to start a whole new conversation now, but I know I'll that you had talked about the CCS in storytelling and things, and yes, she was yes. actually using it as a way of yes. emotionally preparing the, the singer for each of the stanzas in, in, in what they were singing. So they would it. go through, yeah, they'd work through it. the song, pick a card, they'd end up with an image in their head that um, as they approached that particular part, and mm. that became the emotional uh, stimulus I for totally get it. I yeah. absolutely get that that would be a very, very powerful way to use that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Look, Dr. Burns, this has been absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we will put um, lots of links uh, to all your great places, particularly Facebook now, which yeah, I think you're very Yeah, Facebook now. The website for... kind of, yeah, the, the world, my, the network's gotten too big. And the website was for a very specific, you know, for the, really for students who knew me quite well. Uh, now I've got people accessing the work who don't know me from Bar Soap. And the Facebook, the professional page anyway, um, has all of the new stuff, none of which exists on the website itself. So it, that certainly for me is the preferred place that people go. And, you know, and if they hit the like on that, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, I'm usually putting in a uh, a post that kind of lets people know what I'm working on and what's new out there that, you know, I'm trying to access or wanting to access or wanting to offer. So. Um, is that's all freely available for people if they want to engage with that. All right. Thank you very Thank much, Stephanie. You. This has been terrific. Thanks. Well, listen, we will chat again and say hi to the family for me. Thank you. Okay, mate. Ciao. Bye.